All right, would the church say amen again? Amen. Praise the Lord. Another beautiful song. Praise God. I'm going to ask you to do me a favor, church. Can everybody stand up? You've been sitting too long. And while I'm setting up, I want you to stretch and uh, get the blood flowing. Just don't elbow your neighbor or do, go too far with the stretching. <laughs> All right. Keep it going. Give God some praise while you're doing it. It's been a long, somebody asked me how I was doing. I said, it's been a long but strong Sabbath day. <laughs> praise the Lord. All right, you may be seated. Praise the Lord. I promised that I would put my email up there, so to make sure I didn't forget, I put it as the first slide and then I have it as the last slide, but chances are I may forget to click to the last slide. So, <laughs> and I put it up there because if you're interested in getting notes, slides, questions, please feel free to reach out, especially with these presentations. I told one of my sisters the other night, um, you, uh, my dad taught me this, you can't copyright the Holy Spirit. And so if the Holy Spirit gives it to you, it's not mine to begin with. Uh, I'm more than happy to share, and if you want to use it to preach, to teach, um, please do so. Praise the Lord. Um, I've been extremely blessed to be here. And as I was sitting there, I was telling the Lord, I said, Lord, I think, honestly, we're beyond words now. We're beyond words. And I was reminded of a quote when Ellen White, and I'm paraphrasing how she said it, but she said, we don't need to receive any more truth or any, nor, nor, any more truth because we have so much truth that we have yet to live up to. And that's how I feel about this camp meeting. We've received so much blessing so far. We've got so much to live up to. We're beyond words. But I'm going to go ahead and preach anyhow. And I believe that what I'm going to say is going to reemphasize some of the things that the Lord has already addressed. And I pray that this message would be a charge from heaven to set a fire in your bones, that when you leave this place, the fire won't go out until Jesus comes. And that's what we're going to pray for right now. Would you reverently bow your heads as I kneel as we continue to seek the Lord? Father, Lord, you heard what I said. And I believe, Lord, you put that in my mouth. And so, Lord, fulfill your word. Set us on fire. We want to burn like Jeremiah, weary, but we can't, Lord, help ourselves to tell somebody about the love burning in our bones. Now, dear Lord, lead the way. You're the captain. And, Lord, I submit and salute you to lead, lead us out with a fiery message that we will never forget. And we give you the praise in the name of Jesus Christ. Let everyone say, amen. Hallelujah. Kingdom of fire. You know, this world is so interconnected. And I always knew that this world was interconnected. What happens in one country affects the other country. But, you know, when the gas prices were out of this world, when I was driving in the, in the quote unquote hood in, in Sacramento, California, and I was looking at the gas prices in the hood, almost being at $7 a gallon, that's when I knew for sure just how connected this world really is. Of course, the war going on in Ukraine affected us in that manner. And it reminded me of Bible prophecy, because the Bible tells us that Babylon is going to be a universal kingdom. It's going to be connected into one single unit. Interesting article here. A new world order is emerging, and the world is not ready for it. Is that the truth? That's the truth. It's not the truth because this article said it. It's the truth because the Bible says it. What do you say? Amen. Despite the conflicts that we see, even in Ukraine and Russia, North Korea, South Korea, the United States and China, Palestine and Israel, just to name a few, despite the conflicts and divisions that we see, the Bible is still true and Babylon will come as one kingdom. The great reset is on the way. 
And again, I'm not preaching from conspiracy theories. I'm preaching from the word of God. Now, how will the world come together despite the divisions that we see today? For many of us, this is just going to be a reminder. Let us be put to remembrance according to the word. Now, I'm going to tell you there's a lot of scriptures that I'm just going to go through and fire away in the first half of this message, but be ready to open your Bibles very soon. Revelation 13, 11 through 12. How is the world going to be united? And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a what, everyone? Like a lamb. And he spake as a what, everyone? You got to help me talk because I hear my voice going a little bit. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him and causeth the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So notice how the earth all gets on board. The very next verse. And he doeth great wonders so that he maketh what everyone? Fire come down from where? On the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell where? By the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make what? An image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. I don't have the time to unpack this, but this is so powerful. The world comes on board. In the beginning, what you see at the top here, miracles begin to happen in the United States. But specifically, a miracle is mentioned here that unites the whole world, that catches them on fire, so to speak. Fire comes down from heaven. And when the fire comes, all of a sudden, the divisions that were there, they don't completely go away, but they go away to the extent where the world unites into one kingdom called Babylon. Now, this fire spoken of in Revelation 13 represents two things. Well, it's kind of a dual application. Yes, a literal fire will come down from heaven. Satan will personate and cause fire to come down from heaven to deceive the people. A literal fire will come down. Also, this fire from heaven represents a spiritual false revival. You know, we always talk about Satan personating Christ, but he also personates the Holy Spirit. And that's what he's going to do with this false revival, this fire. And what took place in 1 Kings 18 is going to be reversed in Revelation 13. In 1 Kings 18, fire came down from heaven to prove our God was the creator. There was a revival and all the false prophets were slain. In Revelation 13, fire is going to come down from heaven. There's going to be a revival and all the true prophets of God will be persecuted. In reverse. But what was really interesting is that fire, what word did I say? Fire, it's what's going to unite Babylon into one kingdom. Babylon will be a kingdom of fire. Now, how do they get set up to be so? Now, in Revelation 17, there's this woman. Bible students know that according to the word of God, I like to refer to Ephesians 5.25, that a woman represents the church. Now, this woman is sitting on a beast. According to Daniel 7, that represents a political power. So here you have a religious power controlling the political powers of the world. Now, this woman has a cup, and in her cup, is the filthiness of abominations, the wine of the wrath of fornication. Now, she is in the business right now of handing out this wine to all the nations. Now, this wine that she's handing out right now is the setup for the fire that is to come. It actually gets deeper than that. When you sip on this wine, the, in the inevitable conclusion of the continual wine bibbing from Babylon is to be a unfaithful person to God. It leads all the nations to commit fornication, to commit what everyone? Unfaithfulness to the Lord. So this entity, the Roman papacy, is handing out the wine so that folks can get drunk and be unfaithful to the Lord, if I could just say it plainly. And we know according to our teachings and what the word of God says, that this wine points to false doctrines. But did you know that wine in the Bible doesn't just represent false doctrines? It also represents something else. And I think, you know, as Adventists, 
we do need to be, be, be attentive to the false doctrines because look, there's false doctrines flying all over the Adventist church right now. And that's the wine of Babylon. Thank you so much, Pastor. But there's another cup of wine we need to look out for. And I want to touch on that a little bit. It's been touched on this morning and all this week. And I praise God I get to talk about it even now. Luke 21, 34. Notice what Jesus points to this wine and talks to this, what this wine is. And, and, and for Bible students out there, Luke 21 is Luke's version of Matthew 24. So pay attention to what he says. This is equivalent or, 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 or definitely for us in these last days. And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with what, everyone? What's the next word? You know, I asked you to say that word because I, I have a hard time pronouncing that. I don't know how to say it right. So I wanted to <laughs> hear how you said it. Surfeiting, is that it? Surfeiting. You know what that word means? To be giddy with wine to be giddy with wine and drunkenness and cares of this what everyone so that the day come upon you unaware so the wine is pointing to a worldliness and I found this quote in the spirit of prophecy they are drunken but not with wine they stagger but not with strong drink they are what everyone thank you with the cares of this life Notice she's commenting pretty much on Luke 21. Which affect them as strong drink does the drunkard? Are not the senses of such persons perverted? Are they not drunken with the intoxicating cup of what, everyone? Worldliness. Now, isn't that something? That as we're focused on preaching to people to come out of Babylon, maybe Satan has slipped a cup of worldliness right in our home. And we're telling people, put down that other cup, while in our hands, we got a cup. Now, notice this. I work for Apple. Where's my phone? I don't have it. Praise the Lord. I don't need it. It's the only time I get a break from it. And I know we got these devices. These devices are made to be addictive. That's why you go to the bathroom with it. When you wake up in the morning, when it's dinging, and you know you're tired, you got to open your eye to see what's, what message you got. Can I get a witness out there? Amen. And it's morning, afternoon, and evening. Now, I love this picture. You know why? Because when I found it, I said, man, this brother looks like me. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that, is me. that has been me. And he's doing exactly what I was doing. Like, you know you're tired. Go to bed. But no, I got to keep swiping. I got I to keep checking things out. And you, it's, a, it's an addiction. Can I get a witness out there? Yes. And what we're doing, unbeknownst to us, is we're exposing ourselves to the world. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Little break on Sabbath. Somebody say amen. amen. Saturday night, Sunday, Monday. Now, in all seriousness, this message is being brought to us from heaven, I believe, because when we leave this campsite, when we leave each other, when we leave nature, the devices are waiting for you. The world will be waiting for you. Your programs will be waiting for you. Go ahead and enjoy your time at camp meeting. We'll be here waiting for you when you get back. The cup of wine will be at the table. And we're beyond words now, church. It's time for action. And this is the message this evening. Now watch what happens when we continue to expose ourselves to worldliness. Powerful scripture about the wine of worldliness. Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning that they may follow strong drink that continue until night. Doesn't that sound like us? <laughs> Till wine, what's the next word? Inflame them. That means it causes a burning. And guess what this is? It's not a burning for righteousness. You know what the burning's for? Isaiah 9, 18. For wickedness burneth as the fire. So watch this. 
While we're telling people, come out of Babylon, put that cup down, we're literally saying, come out of Babylon. Go, 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 go. Be not partakers of her plagues. Go, 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 go. And the Lord is looking at you like, what is going on? And as you're imbibing the world 24-7, it's causing a burning in your flesh. And all of a sudden, the sins that Jesus gave you victory over are coming right back with a vengeance. There's a burning to listen to that song again, a burning to eat what the Lord gave you victory over, a burning to get back into that habit, and you know he gave you victory over it. It's because you're exposing yourself to the wine that causes the resurrection of the flesh. And it causes you to be unfaithful. Watch this. Whoredom and wine and new wine does what? Take away your heart. You know, I was talking to folks who were ex-Adventists. And of course, they were drunk off the wine of Babylon telling me their evangelical views. And I was really fiery against the wine of Babylon. And as I was coming down against this message, the Lord told me, Adam, be careful how you speak to them and take into account yourself that you don't have the cup of worldliness in your hand while you're trying to educate them to get the cup of Babylon out of theirs. Because both cups lead to the same spirit. Both cups lead to unfaithfulness. Both cups are from the devil. Pick your poison. You know what's interesting about the story of Jeremiah? God's people were stuck between two nations, Egypt and Babylon. Guess which nation God's people put their trust in? Egypt. What does Egypt represent? The world. That's the same for us today. While we're preaching against Babylon, and we should, God is saying, check your house for Egypt. Because both cups lead to unfaithfulness. Both cups will cause you to forget God's law. Because as you imbibe worldliness, it causes a burning of the flesh, and all of a sudden, you're breaking God's commandments, just like the doctrines of Babylon will teach you to do. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not what everyone. You know, now, and the preacher this morning, what a powerful message. He talked about the mask. Let me tell you how powerful deception is, self-deception. This wine is so powerful, it'll cause you to think that, think that you're something that you're not. I want you to think about that. It makes you think that you're something that you're not. You're deceived into thinking you're okay when you're not. So it's not like you have a true knowledge of yourself because the wine has caused you to believe the mask is real. Now, when I saw this verse, if you're deceived by this, you're not wise, I immediately thought of the foolish versions. And I said, Lord, could it be that they're sleeping and foolish because wine has something to do with it? Now, I got a new definition of a fool by looking at this story and this study. A fool, according to Matthew 25, is a church member who has the word of God, the foolish versions, but doesn't have the Holy Spirit. Now, what's deceptive about that is the foolish versions will come to church, have the word of God, don't have the Holy Spirit, and not know it. And that's the power of the wine. Is there an example of that in scripture, Adam? Remember the story in Leviticus chapter 10? These were leaders of the church. God said, Nadab and Abihu, I want you to worship me in the sanctuary. And when you worship me, make sure you get the fire from the altar. Now the fire from the altar represented what everyone? The Holy Spirit. What did it represent? The Holy Spirit. So God says, when you come before me, make sure your vessels filled as a child of God with my spirit. If that makes sense, let me hear you say amen. amen. But you know what they did? You know the story. Instead of grabbing the fire from the altar, they came before the Lord with strange fire, a different spirit. 
Now, I was always under the impression like they did it intentionally. Like they woke up in the morning and said, forget the fire of the Lord. I'm grabbing this campfire. But in my study, I've come to the conclusion that this was not an intentional thing. Something messed with their judgment where they weren't able to tell the difference between clean and unclean. Now, here's how I know this. When the Lord struck them down in that tent, he said, Aaron, come here and bring your two remaining sons here, Eleazar and Ithamar and Moses. Come here. Let me tell you what's going on. And this is what he says in verses 9 and 10. Do not drink wine nor strong drink, thou nor thy sons with thee, when ye go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye, what everyone, die. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations. Here's the key. And that ye may put difference between holy and unholy and between unclean and clean. That means these brothers, because they sipped on the wine, it disturbed their ability to discern the difference as to whether or not they had the Holy Spirit. And it caused such a self-deception, they were shouting hallelujah. Can you imagine that? This is Matthew 7 all day. Lord, we did all this. Lord, we cast out miracles. There's going to be a bunch of people th thinking they had the Holy Spirit, but they had strange fire. And the, the tool to deceive the soul and put them in such a state was wine. Self-examination time. Self-examination time. The fire that's coming down from heaven in Revelation 13, I don't know any other way to say this, but I'm just going to say it the way I know how to say it. The fire that comes down in Revelation 13 is only going to deceive the people, is only going to deceive folks who are already deceived. It's only going to draw in folks who are burning with a different fire. You see, Babylon will be a kingdom united by fire. But before the fire comes down from heaven, the people of Babylon will have a fire burning of the flesh. They fed their flesh so much, they're united by fire in that sense. And when the fire comes down from heaven, it's the cherry on top to bring them all in as one happy family. Now let me get to some good news after this quote. As the storm approaches... A large class who have professed faith in the third angel's message, that's us, but have not been sanctified through obedience to the truth, were not practicing at home, abandon their position and join the ranks of the opposition by uniting with the world and partaking of its spirit. They have come to view matters in nearly the same light. And when the Sunday law comes, when the mark of the beast comes, they are prepared to choose the easy popular side. Do you see what Satan's doing to set us up? We could preach mark of the beast all day, but if we got the wine of the world at home, we're being set up to join the wrong kingdom. Babylon will be united by a false fire, burning with the fires of the flesh that will unite those with like habits like practices like way of thinking and when the miracles come that will be an extra power of satanic delusion that will sweep them all into one miserable family but let's talk about the kingdom of heaven you ready let me read these good scriptures to you daniel chapter 7 verse 9 i beheld till the thrones were cast down and the ancient of days did what everyone whose garment was white as snow and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like what? And his wheels as what? God's throne is on fire. If his throne is on fire, does it make sense that he's on fire? Well, let's verify. Ezekiel saw the same throne. Ezekiel 126. And above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne as the appearance of a sapphire stone. And upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above upon it. And I saw as the color of amber as the appearance of what everyone? 
fire round about within it from the appearance of his loins even upward and from the appearance of his loins even downward I saw as it were the appearance of what everyone fire and it had brightness round about do you notice the description of God here He's a being of fire from the loins up and from the loins down. Our God is on fire. What about the cherubims that are right next to him? Same chapter. As for the likeness of the living creatures, the cherubims, their appearance was like what, everyone? Burning coals of fire. Now, that's interesting. That term, that term burning coals of fire, you find that in reference to, to the coals of fire on the altar of incense, which Nadab and Abihu bypassed. The burning coals of fire in particular represent the Holy Spirit. What does it represent? The Holy so what is God trying to tell us about the angels? They are filled with the Holy Spirit. They are filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, what about the regular angels? God's on fire, stone's on fire, cherubim's on fire. What about the other ranking angels, the lower ranking angels, and the other servants in heaven who maketh his angels, spirits, his ministers, a what, everyone? A flaming fire. This is so powerful to me. Everybody connected with the kingdom of heaven is on fire. Now, that word ministers is beyond angels. It's all God's servants in the heavenly realms. They are connected by fire. They are all on fire. You know what God is telling us? Everybody in the kingdom of heaven has the Holy Spirit. And it's the Holy Spirit that connects you to the kingdom of heaven. What connects you to the kingdom of heaven? The Holy Spirit from eternal ages. It was God's purpose that every created being, from the bright and holy seraph to man should be a temple for the indwelling of the creator. Isn't that powerful? If you want to be a part of the kingdom of heaven, you got to be on fire. When sin came to this world, the fire went out. We were ostracized from the kingdom of heaven. But the good news is, is Jesus came. And notice how he is described according to John. Notice what John says. He was a burning and a shining light. So he came down a man on fire to light us back up again, to connect us back again with the kingdom, the true kingdom of fire. I am come to send fire on the earth. And what will I, Jesus says, if it be already kindled? Aren't you glad that he's come even during this camp meeting, to bring you back into his fiery kingdom, to set you on fire again, because the reception of the Holy Spirit, the reception of this fire in its fullness is the great need of the church today. You know what the question we should be asking ourselves? Your own question to yourself, do I have the Holy Spirit? Self-examination. If we've been imbibing the world all week long and we're coming into church shouting hallelujah, according to the biblical pattern, we got some real praying to do. The question is, do I have the Holy Spirit? My brother went on interviews, because he's a pastor, to interview at different conferences. And you know what the question they asked him at all the conferences he went to? The question they asked him was what's your stance on women's ordination? That's not the question, folks. The question is, do you have the Holy Spirit? Amen. And that's the question we need to ask ourselves today. Do I have the Holy Spirit? Revelation 15, 2. I remember what the preacher said the other night about trials. You're going to Revelation 15, 2. Praise the Lord. Open your Bibles there. And one of the things he mentioned with the purpose of, of trials was to make us fireproof and I believe he quoted Isaiah 33 which says who among us shall d dwell with the devouring fire with everlasting burnings and the answer is right here in Revelation 15 verse 2 notice this verse here and this is the promise of God for you and I and I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with what everyone mingled with what and them that had gotten the victory over the beast 
and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name. Stand. What are they doing? They are standing on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. Now I heard an elder put it this way. This sea of glass is on fire and we're standing on the fire. One elder said this and I like it. He said, Adam, I believe the sea of glass is merely just reflecting the people that are on fire. So they're on fire and standing on it so it looks like the sea is mingled with fire. I said, I like that, elder. That sounds good. It's either that or we're literally standing in fire and we're fireproof. Whatever you choose, we're fireproof. Will somebody say amen? amen? Now let's get to the crux of the matter here. Open your Bibles in Isaiah and let's look at chapter 6. We're going to do some study in here now. I hope you don't mind. Isaiah chapter 6 and verses 1. We're going to see some powerful things here in Isaiah chapter 6. We're going to talk about receiving the fire and maintaining the fire. A question was asked, how do I keep the fire going? We're going to address that in this message. Isaiah 6, 1, let me know you're there by saying amen. amen. Let me say another word of prayer. Father, more of your spirit, please, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Isaiah 6, 1, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord. Who did he see? The Lord. Say it again. The Lord. the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. And his train filled the temple. Here's my question, Bible students. Who did Isaiah see? He saw the Lord. But let's get even more specific. Did he see God the Father or did he see God the Son? Let's prove it from the word of God. Now, book this. We're not going to go here for time, but book it, write it, take a picture of it, study it. John 12, 39 through 41. John 12, 39 through 41. John is commenting on Isaiah 6. If you have a bookmark in your Bible, keep it at Isaiah 6 because we're camping there to study. John is com commenting on Isaiah 6. And he mentions in these verses who Isaiah saw. And he specifically says that Isaiah saw the glory of Christ. So who did Isaiah see? Jesus. Brother Adam, what difference does that make who he saw? Whether it was God the Father or God the Son, it makes all the difference in the world. You ready to continue to study? Here's my question, Bible students. When did Jesus begin his ministry in the sanctuary? I knew that was going to be the answer. That's absolutely wrong. Say it again, preacher. The preacher said AD 31. Is he right? Absolutely right. Praise the Lord. He began his ministry in AD 31. Isaiah was alive about 700 years or so before Christ was born. So the vision that he saw was most definitely a vision of the future. He did not see Jesus in his time. He saw Jesus in the future. Now it gets sweeter than that. Notice specifically when in time he sees Jesus. Now, Jesus has been in the sanctuary since AD 31 till this day. That's a long time, folks. The Bible gives us a precise time. Well, not a date or anything, but a precise time, an event to when we know exactly when Isaiah sees Jesus. You ready to continue to study? This is exciting to me with Bible study. Now, there's two clues in Isaiah 6 where God gives us two clues to tell us when in time Jesus is being seen by Isaiah. Clue number one, we're just in Isaiah. We're looking at verse number three. Are you there? And one cried unto another, one of the seraphims, and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. That's clue number one. The whole earth is is present tense full of his glory all right clue number two is in the next verse you're looking in your bibles and the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried and the house was filled with smoke that's clue number two clue number one the earth is present tense filled with the glory of god clue number two the house or the temple that he's viewing is filled with smoke. So I want you to be in Isaiah's shoes. As he sees Jesus in the temple, the temple's filling up with smoke, and on the earth, the earth is full of the glory of God in that moment in vision. Let's deal with clue number one. 
When will the earth be full of the glory of God? Thank you, preacher. God prophesied in Numbers 14, 21 to Moses, to his messed up church, the church that was doubting him, the church that wanted to go back to Egypt, the church that was full of complaining. He said, Moses, but as truly as I live, Moses, all the earth shall, future tense, be filled with the glory of God. I'm going to have a church that doesn't complain. I'm going to have a church that trusts me. I'm going to have a church that gives me praise. I'm going to have a bunch of Joshua's and Caleb's. The whole earth shall be full of my glory. The church kept acting up until Babylon was coming. And he prophesied to Habakkuk, Habakkuk, let me tell you something. For the earth shall be. One day, Habakkuk, my people are not going to worship idols. One day, Habakkuk, they're going to love me with all their heart. One day, Habakkuk, they're going to shine with my glory. And the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. And that day is soon coming, folks. The pastor said it. It's going to happen in Revelation 18, verse 1, when that mighty angel comes down and the earth is lightened with the glory of God. You know what that means? This is the latter rain, by the way. This is the outpouring of God's spirit right before he comes. Isaiah did not see Christ beginning his ministry. He was watching Christ towards the end of his ministry. And he was seeing Isaiah, Jesus in the temple when the earth was present tense, full of the glory of God. That means he was witnessing the character of God being poured out beyond measure. Now notice this. When would the temple be filled with smoke? This is powerful, y'all. When would the temple be filled with smoke? Revelation 15, 7. Revelation 15, 7. And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God, who liveth forever and ever. Next verse. And the temple was filled with what, everyone? Smoke from the glory of God and from his power and no man was able to enter into the temple help me lord till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled now this part is so sweet to me because he sees the temple being filled with smoke revelation 15 tells us that that's the close of probation it's what everyone so the temple's being filled with smoke the earth is lightened with the glory of god that means his spirit the character of love is being seen in his people for the first time as a single unit ever. It's going to happen soon, folks. And Isaiah saw that moment in time. And the temple was filled with smoke, which points to the close of probation. But I know probation didn't close yet in Isaiah's vision. You know why? Let's look at Isaiah 6, verse 1. This is good. Are you there? Hopefully you're still there. Look at verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord doing what? Doing what? Sitting. Doing what? Sitting. Sitting. Michael had not stood up yet. He didn't stand up. You know why? Because he had Isaiah's out there. I can imagine Jesus on the throne and Gabriel coming up to him saying, Lord, your people are filled with the spirit. Lord, it's time to pick them up. Lord, probation is closed. And Jesus is saying, no, no, no. Let me get one more. I don't want to get up right now. And I believe that's the impression that Isaiah felt. He saw the glory of God being poured out. He saw Jesus. He should have got up. He should have got up, but he said, I'm not going to get up because I'm waiting on you. And I praise God for his mercy. How long has he been waiting on us? How long has he been waiting on you? How long has he been knocking on the door? How long? Isaiah experienced that. Now notice what Isaiah saw and what Jesus looked like. I'm going to take you to Malachi 3 verse 1 because Malachi saw Jesus in the temple. The message that God has given us is a precious message. Malachi 3 verse 1, notice the description of Christ in the temple and what he's doing. Behold, I will send my messenger and he shall prepare the way before me and the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple. Even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in, behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But who may abide the day of his coming and who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a what everyone? 
Now notice it doesn't say Jesus just comes to bring the fire. It says Jesus is the fire. He is like a refiner's fire and like fuller soap, and he shall sit as a what, everyone? A refiner, and what else? Purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in what? Righteousness. Isaiah saw a Lord on fire. He saw God not only on fire, but he was doing a work on fire in the time of sending down the fire. And Isaiah said, wait a minute, Lord, I'm not on fire. The character that's being spread throughout the earth, I don't reflect that glory. You know what blows my mind is when preachers tell me that Jesus can come into your heart and then in the same breath tell me that we can never get the victory over sin. Does the fire not refine? Does the fire not purify? Does the fire not purge? And Isaiah saw victory in Jesus. He saw hope in Jesus. And not just in Jesus, in the glory of God's people on earth. Another thing caught his attention in heaven. Verse 2 says, above it, above the throne stood the seraphims. Now these are the bodyguards. These are the special forces around the throne of God. You're not getting to God anyhow, but especially you're not crossing these guys. The seraphim were no joke. Now that's the plural word. The singular word is seraph. You know what the word seraph, the singular word means? It means burning one. It means to be on fire. So Isaiah is looking at Jesus on fire. The angel right next to him is on fire. And all he's saying is holy, holy, holy. To be on fire is to give God praise in a life of holiness, not just in words, but in deeds. And when he saw what church was supposed to look like, let me tell you something about Isaiah. He was a preacher of righteousness. Before Isaiah 6, he was preaching to the church. In Isaiah chapter 5, he was preaching so hard hard and heavy I counted six woes in Isaiah 5 that means he was coming down on the church woe unto you woe unto you woe unto you woe unto you but when he saw church in heaven he said woe unto me <laughs> when he saw the angel looking like his savior they both looked like fire and he saw the fire on the earth and he said I'm a preacher but this whole time, I haven't had the Holy Spirit. Can you imagine that thought? I'm a preacher, but I don't have the Holy Spirit. Lord, please don't pass me by. Can you understand the urgency in Isaiah? Lord, keep sitting on that throne. Please give me your Holy Spirit. I realize that I'm wretched. I realize that I'm a hypocrite. I realize my need. No more woe unto them, Lord. Woe unto me. Set me on fire. Let me be a part of your kingdom. And then the Lord looked upon him. You know what Jesus says? I love Jesus. And I love his words. And it was Jesus in the temple there. This is what he says to us. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are you when you realize I don't have the Holy Spirit. Blessed are you when you realize that I've been destitute for years. Blessed are you when you realize I've been drinking a cup of worldliness and I'm confused. Blessed are you when you realize your need. For theirs, Jesus said, is the kingdom of heaven. Now, we always jump to the conclusion that that means, oh, I get to go to heaven. But that's not what it primarily means. Because Jesus says in Luke 17, 21, the kingdom of God is where? Within you. So blessed are you when you realize I don't have the Holy Spirit because now I can give you the Spirit of God and set you on fire. And I believe that through the messages, the altar calls, the hands that were raised this week, the Holy Spirit has been given. I believe many of us through the messages and fellowship, we have seen our need as Isaiah did. We've cried out to the Lord and we've asked for change, have we not? We've asked for the Holy Spirit. And you know what he says in his word? If we ask, we shall receive. And I know you all came to the altar and you raised your hands with sincere hearts. So that means the coal of the altar was delivered. We're getting ready to leave. And the question now becomes, how do I keep the fire burning? 
We're going to face a world of temptation out there. You've confessed. You've seen your need, most of us. And now it's time to be faithful. And there's two points that I'm going to cover before I close. But please pay attention. Continuing in the scripture, notice what it says. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth, which represents the heart, because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Will somebody say amen? amen. When the Holy Spirit comes into your life, and you've asked him to come, he immediately begins a work of consuming sin. To sin, wherever found, our God is a consuming fire. Hebrews 12, 29. In all who, what's the next word? Submit. Let me read it again. In all who submit to his power, the spirit of God will consume sin. You want to keep the fire burning? Then you keep submitting. The day you stop surrendering is the day the fire begins to go out. And if you want the fire to continue to burn, you have to continue to surrender every single day. Can I get an amen out there? Amen. Don't you dare miss your appointment with Jesus tomorrow morning. Surrendering everything that you gave to him during this camp meeting. Don't you dare miss that appointment. Surrendering with all sincerity your weakness and trusting in his word. And what the Holy Ghost would do as you leave this place, he will con continue to convict you of the commitments you have made. And those who have not made commitments, he will convict you of commitments you need to make. He will lead you in the way. He will speak to you because once you re realize your need, he will talk and tell you which way to go. And he does his job very well. And as servants of the Lord now, our simple job is to surrender with all our heart, like Isaiah, with an urgency and have that experience that he had. Now notice the promise of God. For if ye live after the flesh, drinking that wine, feeding that flesh, right? Ye shall die. But if ye through what, everyone? The Spirit. Through who? Through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body. Now that you have the Holy Spirit, you can depend upon him to destroy that lust that's been whipping you up and down like a slave. You can depend upon him to give you the victory over everything that has put you in shackles to the thing that you're even scared of out there or facing when you leave this tent. When you put your faith in the Spirit of God, he will do what he promised he will do. But you ready for a reality check? You ready for it? Here it is. This is going to be a painful process. It's going to be a painful process. When you get out of here, you've made commitments and you surrender. For the most part, God is going to take you through the fire. A union with Christ by living faith is enduring. Every other union must perish. But this union costs us something. There will be a struggle with outward and internal obstacles. There must be a painful work of detachment as well as a work of attachment. Pride, selfishness, vanity, worldliness, sin in all its forms must be overcome if we would enter into a union with Christ. Lord, why do we have to go through pain? Why do we have to go through struggle? Why do we have to be uncomfortable in our battle with sin? You know, the cross really is the power of God. In the sanctuary, it's the brazen altar that represents the cross. Now, in the sanctuary service, that brazen altar was lit on fire 24-7. The fire was never to go out. That was to illustrate that when Jesus got on the cross, he entered the fire. Now, because he stayed in the fire, he could have got up. He could have said, this is uncomfortable. He could have said, this is too painful. 
He could have got up any time, but because he endured the flame, because he remained in the fire, the power of sin was broken. Because he remained in the fire, the power of the devil was destroyed. Because he remained in the fire, the glory of God was revealed. If you choose to remain in the fire, the Holy Ghost is going to speak and say, enter the fire, honor your commitment. I'll strengthen your will. Your flesh is going to bother you, but I'll strengthen your heart. You'll be united with a power that you have never felt before, a willpower to push you through the struggle, push you through the pain, push you through the withdrawals. But if you stay in the fire, I will break the power of sin in your life. If you stay in the fire, I will break the power of the enemy, how he used to whip you up and down with that thing for years. Stay in the fire, the Lord is saying. And you will be a new creature in Christ. You heard the saying, no pain. That's gospel truth. No pain, no gain. That is gospel truth. What do you gain? A deeper trust in God. What do you gain? Character development. What do you gain? Strength to resist evil. What do you gain? And, un and you understand a little bit more the struggle he went through for you. And that binds you closer to Christ. Many of us say, Lord, I want a closer relationship with you. Jesus says, come in the fire because that's where I am. You want to get to know me more? Get in the fire and I'll show up. What's interesting about this story is that they went into the fire with bands in their hands and they came out and the bands were loosed. And that's what the Lord is calling you to. This is my last point. You want the fire to keep burning? Notice what happens next in this story. And this, we're still in Isaiah. He realized this need. God gives him the fire. It consumes iniquity. And the very next thing, watch this. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips. Thy iniquity is taken away. Thy sin purged. Verse 8. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then said I, Isaiah is jumping up and down in my mind. Here am I. Send me. As soon as he sets you on fire, he calls you to go immediately. Why? Because you're on fire. He calls you to action. You ready for a reality check again? Here it is. There can be no inactivity without spiritual death. In other words, if you don't go, the fire will go out. So not only is God asking you to surrender and trust him, he's asking you to get busy in the field, busy in the vineyard. Can I get an amen out there? When I gave my heart to the Lord, you heard my testimony. He gave me the scripture in Isaiah 42, 5 through 9. In that passage of scripture was not only a promise of deliverance, it was a call to go. In the same scripture, he called me to go and preach to the Gentiles and set the captives free. You know why he called me to go immediately? Because he understands how weak I am. That when the flesh comes, I'm going to fold. When temptation comes, I can't bear the weight. And I, and I will only gain, gain the strength to resist evil by aggressive service. Notice what she says. I could pray all day long. That's not how I get the strength to resist evil. If I'm praying and I'm not doing nothing, you're actually doing a disservice to the gospel. You know what happens when you do that? Notice what she says. And I'm, I'm almost done. He who does nothing but pray will soon cease to pray. Or his prayers will become a formal routine when men take themselves out of social life, away from the sphere of Christian duty and cross-bearing, when they cease to work earnestly for the master who worked earnestly for them, they lose the subject matter of prayer and have no incentive to devotion. Their prayers become personal and selfish. Have mercy. Have mercy. Many of us come to church, we come to camp meetings, we expect the camp meeting to revive us. For a week or so, we're revived, then we're right back to the vomit. Why is that? Because the strength to resist evil is best gained by aggressive service. When the fire comes upon you, he says continually to surrender, and he calls you to get busy to keep the fire burning. You know, when I gave my heart to the Lord, he taught me Christianity 101 in so many ways. You know, all I had was a testimony. 
My mind was damaged by drugs. I snorted so much cocaine, I had nosebleeds all the time because I snorted so much. I couldn't remember anything because I damaged my brain. But when I gave my heart to the Lord, truly he started to rebuild my mind for his word. And this is how he did it. I was so full of the goodness of God when he sent his Holy Spirit to me that I had to tell somebody. So you know what I did? All I had was a testimony. I didn't know nothing about this book. I would go out there and knock on some doors. My heart is pounding. I'm sweating. I'm nervous. You know what all those feelings are? It's the death of self. One of the best ways to kill self is to go canvassing. Somebody say amen. amen. Go knock on somebody's door. That's how you kill self. So as I'm knocking on the door, somebody opened the door. I'm just like, yo, the Lord just saved me. I was addicted to drugs, addicted to alcohol for many years, and God just saved my life. If you're struggling with anything, I'm just here to tell you that God can deliver. Amen. People will be crying. People want prayer. Then people start asking me Bible questions. Brother, what does the Bible say about this? What about this? And I'm like, uh, I don't know. But can I come back tomorrow or next week with the answer? They said, yeah, praise the Lord. Now, I was going out with a crew, the same the Bible study crew that, that helped to inspire me to cry out to the Lord. The Lord linked me up with that crew, and we were all of like mind, and we would go out on Sabbaths and do the work of Isaiah 58. And all we had was a story. This is why it's important when you go home to get in the fire. Because once you surrender to the fire, you know what that's called? A testimony. And once you have a testimony, then you have something to tell. You don't even have to have the knowledge of the Bible. Just tell what the Lord has done for you. Now, when I told them this, they said, let me get some answers to Bible questions. I said, I'll come back. Then I would go back with the study group. We would study and ask the Lord because now we had a reason to pray. Now God had a super reason to answer. And he did, and he gave me guidance. And this is one of the main reasons I became educated in the word of God. Because I was educating myself to give answers to those who were thirsty. And I would come back the next day, and this is how you keep the fire burning. You're so busy doing God's work, you're not even having time to pay attention to the devil's temptations. So in summary, I want to be a part of the kingdom of fire. And this whole camp meeting was to bring you back into the kingdom. We've seen our need. We've surrendered to the Lord. And if you haven't, you're going to have another opportunity. And all he wants to do is set you on fire. And this is beautiful. Because once you're on fire, you actually make the gospel attractive. I got one more quote here, I think. The word of God spoken by one who is himself sanctified through it has a life-giving power that makes it attractive to the hearers and convicts them that it is a living reality. So you see why at home, you're going to struggle. You're going to go through the pain of withdrawals. But as you're in the fire, you don't know that that fire is causing you to glow. That fire is causing you to shine. And it's in your weakest moments he becomes strong. And you go out flamed up, burning because of your sacrifice at home. And it's in that state you got a testimony now. Lord, I'm struggling with talking to this person. But I submitted to your grace. And I let your fire consume the bitterness in my heart. And I spoke to the person. And all of a sudden, a miracle happens of healing in your life. And in that individual, then you got a testimony to tell. And now you can knock on the door and share that with someone else to give them hope. Can somebody say amen? amen? So God's desire, Laodicea, is if you haven't opened the door, open the door. He's been waiting such a long time. Open the door. Surrender your heart to the Lord. Let him take the cup of wine from your table and follow his lead whithersoever he goeth. Your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed. Father, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to make an appeal to the individual who has yet to surrender to the Lord. If you haven't made a commitment to surrender like Isaiah, and through this camp meeting and the messages of God, and God has told you, this is the time. 
and you have not yet come to the altar or you have not yet raised your hand, this is your opportunity now before heaven, before our merciful Savior, just to make that surrender and commitment again and ask for the Holy Spirit. Is there anyone that have not yet made that surrender or commitment? If you're that person, come to the altar. We'll kneel together. We'll pray. Is there one person? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. As I pray, the invitation is still open. If no one comes, I, I'm, by faith, I'm going to take that. We're all in the position that we've made a commitment. And I praise God for that. My second appeal is that after you leave this, you want to continue to surrender. You want God to light you on fire and you want to go. Those three things. You want to surrender. You want to be lit up and you want to go. If that's your desire, just raise your hand and we're going to close out in prayer. Amen. Amen. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for gathering your people here to hear your word and to be influenced by your presence and to be relieved of burdens. Lord, we have made commitments all week. We've come to the altar. We've raised our hands. We've confessed our sins. We've seen ourselves. And now, Lord, with the power of your Holy Spirit, we have work to do. And that work is putting our faith in you tomorrow morning, making a surrender to whatever you bring to our attention, being brave by your grace to enter into the fire that you've called us to enter into. And as we're being consumed by your presence to go forward into the land and teach somebody how good God has been to us. We thank you. We are looking forward to the fellowship of us and you in the field and the vineyard and a new experience after this camp meeting. Thank you. In Jesus' name, let God's people say amen. 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 God bless you all.